So what I want to show you are uh, some cases which are, uh, I'm not going to show you perfect cases. I have a lot of cases where everything went beautiful, cement went in just the right space. Um, but uh, I don't think, uh, if I were you sitting in the audience, I'd want to see the cases that were difficult. The ones that uh, gave me pause to, you know, should I do something different? Uh, should I stop now, continue on? I mean, those are the useful ones. So. Um, where the real challenges in this, by the way, aren't really technical. You know, the uh, procedure works well. If your goal is to treat pain, it works. Uh, if you're, um, if you're um, trying to uh, completely sterilize a uh, tumor and, uh, and affect uh, long-term outcomes and, and lifespan, uh, that's maybe a little more shaky. Uh, the real challenges are getting patients. Uh, how do you get patients? And um, how do you make sure that this continues to get paid over the years? I think that's probably um, part of the future question will be how we uh, make sure that the technology isn't sort of abused and used just for money, but rather used for the intended purpose. And, and uh, insurance companies see that we're using it correctly, and uh, they keep paying. So uh, that's just maybe a little off the topic. but. Um, this is the uh, first patient. This um, has uh, this is a 54-year-old um, who, um, OK, so this is good. This is uh, describing how do I get patients. So I told you that's the hard part. Um, one way is to be responsive and quick. Uh, at my location, I'm seeing more and more of this practice where the, uh, the hospitalists or the primary care people will have a patient with potentially a surgical, potentially an oncology, maybe a radiation, maybe an IR need. They don't really care who is doing it. They just consult everybody at once. So um, in this case, you know, whoever got there first was, uh, was the one to get their uh, impressions in first. Um, in this case, um, uh, this lady had a new breast mass. Uh, otherwise, completely healthy lady uh, came in with uh, some uh, tumors in her spine and uh, some severe pain. Uh, she had fallen a few weeks ago, and that's when the pain really began. Um, the, um, uh, so I'll continue on. So here she is. You can see uh, multiple levels of tumor. It's pretty obvious where it is. There's even some retropulsion. Um, this shows some T6 disease as well. So there's obviously multifocal disease. Lady's got pain. Uh, everybody's asking for a biopsy because she's fresh off the street with uh, no uh, explanation where this is coming from. So it's not uncommon that I'll, I'll get patients, one, by being receptive and quick to the consults that are the shotgun approach. Number two is um, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, requests for biopsies of tumors in the spine that often aren't filtered through the IR people. A lot of times they'll go through the diagnostic radiology people. And uh, they'll, they'll just take the, the request, they'll do the procedure, not talk to the patient, has no idea if they have pain or not, and uh, is really kind of a shame. So one way is to, uh, is to work more with your, your diagnostic colleagues and uh, let them know, hey, you know, this lady needs a biopsy, but we could also go up, see if she has pain. We could treat this. We could do everything all in one step. And uh, that's pretty popular. So the plan here is I uh, saw the lady. I, uh, I have a few selection criteria. One, of course, must have pain. That's obvious. Number two, they, they have to have edema on MRI. And number three, I have to be able to pound like with my uh, uh, deep percussion with kind of my ulnar stylate process, I guess, on, on the whole spine. And if I'm not getting pain when I'm actually hitting those uh, spinous processes, then I'm starting to think maybe the pain is due to something else, all the chronic uh, causes of back pain. So uh, those three things are really important. You want to you make sure you have good results by selecting the correct patients. So. Um, so in this case, uh, yeah, the standard shotgun approach, Radonk was there in a heartbeat, as they always are. Um, uh, the, uh, the ortho spine guys were, were fast, but they were half a day, which was too much. Uh, the neuroradiologists just take orders and never come see the patient. Um, so we went up and saw him, and, uh, and we continued on. So uh, what I found with her was she had pain at T6, and she had pain at thoracolumbar junction. She had so two spots, they matched the MR. So now what do I do? Do I, do I ablate T6 and T12 and L1? Do I just go crazy and do them all? So I, I would say no. I think uh, this is one of the cases, uh, it, this, this practice in general is evolving, and, and it uh, could be perceived as something that's taking away from another specialist, as in radonx, right? So they've got all the patients. Right now, they radiate them all. And we're the new guy, the new underdog, suggesting we have something new, better, different. Uh, I would say that you should come at it from your practices. Hey, this is a way to augment what you're already doing. You should continue doing what you're doing now. 
let me uh, treat them uh, early on. We'll get, we'll get sooner pain control and better pain control. And then you continue radiating. And uh, those two statements are, are true. You will get pain control faster. Good chance you'll get it as they roll off the table. And um, radiation sometimes takes some time, maybe even a few weeks. So in this case, I elected, okay, T6, it's more dangerous. I'd rather not do it if I don't have to. I'll take care of 12 L1, let the patient know that 6 is still probably going to hurt, but it's going to be better, and uh, radiate afterwards. So that's the plan. It's pretty simple. Um, didn't know how many users are at what stage. I can see most of you guys are doing kyphos already and very used to cement and uh, the technique. You know, I wanted to just remind, um, I know there's a couple of users. I met a fellow who, uh, who hasn't done these before, but uh, you know, the obvious things, this is the spinal canal. When your trocar is starting to cross the, the medial border of the pedicle, you're potentially in the spinal canal. So how do you know where you are? Well, you look at the lateral. And here's the, here's the back of the, the uh, vertebral body. So you need to be in front of this line when you're starting to cross medial to that line. So, I mean, that's, that's obvious, but it's a good chance to mention it. Um, the, um, the, uh, I, I'm really, I don't use, interesting that Ilya is losing a lot of CT, and, um, and that's neat, um, because I can now see everybody does this different. I thought that we all did it the same. I, I never use CT or cone beam, even though I have cone beam and we use it all the time. Um, uh, not saying what's right or wrong, just a statement of uh, practice. But what I am is I'm really uh, anal about making the image perfect. You know, this is a case where it is not perfect. The ribs aren't lined up, so I know it's not a true lateral. So am I positive that this is actually not coming out of the vertebral body anteriorly? Because, you know, it's a, it's a, on the axial plane, it's a circle. You could actually be exiting the vertebral body if you're not on a true lateral. So... Um, um, so I'd use floor only, but I'm really careful about the, uh, the positioning. Um, uh, so uh, at this point, this could be any case. This could be, uh, this could be a star case. It could be a kypho case. Uh, you know, you don't really know. But um, in this lady, I did a biopsy. I, uh, I should probably go back. Um, describing the technique for a biopsy, it's very much like other vendors. Uh, you, you use an inner uh, biopsy device, a hollow uh, uh, stylet essentially, and um, and you uh, proceed forward beyond your introducer, of course. And I, I found that I, I often don't get sample um, if I'm not uh, twisting it as I pull it back out, and uh, I like to put suction on it, and I tend to get a little more sample that way. Um, so here's the unique stuff. Um, this is what's interesting about the uh, about the define uh, devices because the uh, the navigational component uh, is is very useful. Um, I got into this. Uh, I, I came up with uh, define when I was doing a lot of body uh, RFAs and ablations, and I thought, geez, we should be ablating tumors in the spine. And uh, along comes uh, define. So I started trying it, and I got good results. And uh, and here I am. So um, uh, the, uh, um, there's a, a few types of, of uh, ways to create a cavity uh, in order to allow you to introduce the trocar. Um, the company makes an, an MLO or midline osteotome, and they make a newer power curve. So another way to say that is there's the old device, there's the new device. The new device is uh, more rigid, definitely more robust. Um, my, uh, my technique is that I, I always place the osteotome first and create a path in the tumor. And then I, I place the uh, electrode subsequent to that. The electrode's a little delicate. I, uh, I uh, prefer not to twist it, don't hammer it, uh, you know, be gentle with the thing. Uh, do your, your more aggressive work with the osteotome. Um, so here is the uh, the star osteo the uh, star uh, electrode. Um, we've gone over what it is and how it works, but I mean the, the important things to remember. I mean things you must know to be safe is this is the center of the ablation right there, and uh, this is the uh, distal electrode. Uh, this space is actually uh, controlled by you turn uh, the device which extends this forward. So if you haven't created a space first for it to extend into, and you might be in a tumor that's kind of hard, you won't be able to extend the electrode tip. And then, then this space between the bipolar um, electrodes is going to be smaller. You're not going to get the shape and size of ablation you're expecting. So um, 
Also, if, uh, if you're thinking this looks a little bit delicate, I would say you're correct. This is not something you want to twist or hammer on. Um, I've never had a problem, never broken one, but you know that's because I've been I've been careful with it. Um, this lady, I, uh, I my goal was two levels, of course. So uh, this slide shows uh, that I'm working on uh, one level below while I'm getting access above and starting to create a new cavity. Um, the uh, the uh, I found that the device is very directable. The uh, the original MLO midline axi midline osteotome uh, was uh, very directable. The newer version, uh, the power curve is even more directable. Um, this is uh, uh, describing uh, some of the things that we'll talk more about in the lab. But um, this is the uh, inter the tip of the introducer, and then this is the cement delivery device. And uh, they call it locking because, you know, back on the outside of this, you need to, to lock the cement to the introducer. Otherwise, when you start injecting and pressurizing this space, it'll push the, the uh, cement uh, delivery device backwards. Um, okay. So uh, here's some of the cases where I told you I'm going to show you things that weren't perfect. And um, because... Uh, Injecting cement, I think you all inject a lot of cement and a lot of osteoporotic vertebral bodies. You're very used to how the cement uh, travels, if it's kind of a globular pattern, a trabecular pattern. Um, you're, you're very aware of you know, allowing the cement to harden a little bit or not, depending on what vendor you're using. Uh, it's, a, it's an art, and we all know that pretty well. What's interesting about what we're here to discuss today is that we're, we're putting cement into solid tumors, not necessarily bones. And that's a really very different animal. So I want to show you what you should get used to seeing when you start cementing a solid tumor that you just ablated. It doesn't look like, um, like a cement traveling in an 85-year-old uh, uh, non-pathologic fractured vertebral body. And instead, what you get are things like this. So, I see this type of uh, um, thing much more commonly when I'm injecting a solid tumor. This is, you know, paravertebral vein. You can see the paravertebral vein going anterior here. You can see a little cement starting to show up that's traveling backwards along the length of the uh, cannula. Um, these, this is just reality. These are the things you're watching for. It happens a, a lot more commonly than when you're just injecting a vertebral body that's just pure mush and everything is easy. So you need some good imaging, and you want to you want to keep uh, diligent, keep watching what you're doing. Um, the uh, uh, I want to show you some of the uh, other spots. This is that uh, this is the cement traveling back along the trocar and uh, coming out along the side of your your um, uh, tract as you traverse down through the pedicle. And uh, I'll show you a CT of where that is. Uh, you know, interestingly, despite the fact that people would get excited at these results, uh, I haven't really had uh, many cases where I had any negative effect or impact from this. But um, uh, still, uh, it happens. The, uh, it's uh, interesting to see that the, uh, the, the osteotome really does create a tract, so the cement will definitely go where you put the osteotome. It, it travels the path of least resistance, of course. So if your goal is um, to uh, distribute cement you know, in a certain area, you really want cement to be right there, you just need to direct your osteotome there, and it'll go there. Um, and in fact, it will go wherever you put the osteotome. So here's the, the straight line osteotome or the biopsy device. That's that straight. And then uh, you could see that we curved off to the, to the midline and the cement it went to those places preferentially and first. Um, but you're going to expect to see cement, and this is the, uh, that little tail that was going in the paravertural body. These are those two little nubbins that were coming off um, uh, back here. So here they are. In this case, it's, it's lateral to the uh, pedicle, so not, not a real big deal. Here's a little bit that's just coming through a tiny little fracture in the uh, side of the pathologic uh, vertebral body. Uh, it kind of goes everywhere, so you want to think, uh, you want to become more used to sort of the atlas of cement distribution. You want to uh, be aware of what each of those looks like. Um, so this lady had actually really good pain relief. Um, she still had some pain in her upper thoracic region from that T6, but uh, usually when people have fractures, their pain is just so uh, unbearable that even a, a small amount of relief puts a smile on their face and they're happy. Um, and that was the case with this lady. So she went on to uh, external beam uh, of all the levels that were pathologic, and, uh, and this went well. Um, so... There's another case of, uh, of an RFA uh, 
spine. This is a 47-year-old, has esophageal cancer. I uh, had, uh, in this case, I had a uh, PET-CT to, TT to look at. Um, uh, this patient uh, was moving some heavy cement blocks. Interesting, this, the histories that you get there, uh, this one was obvious sometimes, but more commonly I get stories like I was just bending over in the shower. It's often not a very dramatic uh, history, but the history is, is really critical to selecting patients. If somebody has this back pain for their whole life, they somehow get a, an MRI and it shows fractures, it doesn't mean it's necessarily the source. So I actually spend quite a bit of time in clinic talking about exactly when do the pain start. It's, it's really uh, reassuring to find a point in time when the pain uh, got worse or developed, um, and uh, you can correlate it with edema on an MRI, and when you, you do pound or deep percussion, uh, you get pain. Those three things, you're really guaranteed to get a good result. Um, so this person was on a lot of uh, opiates um, and also needed a biopsy. So this, this one I also intercepted through the diagnostic guys. They had ordered a uh, biopsy with no thought for treating pain, no thought for RFA or cement. Um, and uh, so none of these cases fall in my lap, that's for sure. I have to go after each one. Um, I've been doing these for about two years at my institution. So after two years of this kind of hard groundwork, legwork, chasing things down, you know, still they're not falling in my lap. So it really does take effort. Um, so here we've got the standard, the standard three things that we really must have. You need edema or replacement of fat on marrow signal. Either is fine. Um, uh, so uh, I think a lot of IR people are kind of engineers. They really like to see the, the mechanics of how this thing works. This is the, uh, this is the, the actual x-ray of uh, the diagrams we've seen before. Uh, pretty neat to see how the, uh, the concept that um, you know, RFA energy is traveling along these electrodes. Cement traverses through this portion of the introducer there where it's heated. This is the reservoir where the cement is, uh, is thick but not as thick as after it passes beyond this point. Um, some of the things that are kind of nice to be aware of how this is working is, let's say you're doing a case and you, you, uh, you want to delay your injection for a moment because you see it going into the disc, for example, and you say, okay, I'll let it harden a bit in the body. So think about uh, the fact that the cement from here to here already passed the electrode, so that stuff is a little warmer. So you may want to choose the amount of time you wait carefully, or it might start to get too hard. If you really wanted to, you could just take the, the uh, cement uh, device out. You could turn it back on on the table and let, let the cement that's been pre-warmed just exit on the table and uh, throw it away, because I, I never run out of uh, volume. There's always enough. Uh, the working time is long as well, um, not just a sales pitch. It actually is uh, quite long. But uh, the cases where I have had to stop early is because I, I, I uh, wasn't thinking about this cement's pre-hardened and it's in the body already, so it's got a couple extrinsic sources of heat, so it's catalyzing faster. So once you remove the catalyzer, yep. does yep. the cement, does the cement material just come out or Oh, uh, yeah, so the cement, when you pull this out, uh, the cement at the tip of your uh, cement delivery device and, and the cement that's in the blob, it usually separates. And uh, it feels real rubbery. It feels rubbery for quite a long time. So even if you drug some back into your, uh, into your uh, working cannula, you could still push it forward when you reintroduce the device in a few moments. Um, so um, this is another common practice that I run into that I think is just a daily practical consideration. So you got a patient, they need a biopsy, you intercepted the case as a biopsy, you said, hey, they got pain, I think we should treat the pain. Uh, so now what do you do? You need to do a biopsy. Should you do the biopsy first, a whole, come back as a whole separate procedure, and then do the ablation? Um, those are just those common things you don't think of until uh, the, the case actually shows up. My preference is this. I, I actually will uh, review the biopsy specimen in the room. You know, pathology tech brings it in, rolls in the microscope. I look at the slides. Uh, if you're like a lot of IR practices like mine, where you're used to looking for atypical cells, I can tell atypical cell versus not. If I see that it looks like it's atypical and we're not sure this is a tumor or not, I, uh, I decide at that moment and I go ahead and ablate. If I don't see anything that's uh, unusual, um, all the cells look just like bland, whatever organ I'm in, in this case bone marrow, then I'll just cement. So 
why is that interesting? That's interesting because with, uh, with the defines uh, devices, you have the option to do one or both. So you kind of have some freedom to, um, to make decisions. You know, we all want to think we're doctors that make our own decisions a a on the fly, right? Because that's, that's more fun. So um, if you're using define, it's nice because if, if I don't see atypical cells, I figure I don't need to ablate this. This really is into pathologic fracture, and I uh, just cement with the uh, uh, and skip the RFA. Um, so you have the option to do both. That's a little bit unique. Can I ask you a question? Sure. How do you navigate the preauthorization process? Yeah. So the vast majority, I, I try always to see them in clinic first. Right. Uh, I think that's really essential to get that preauth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I right. I pre-author everything, and the reason is uh, so. I say I'm going to do an RFA on a case, and we're not totally sure that it's a tumor. I at least in Arizona, I haven't found insurance companies savvy enough to question the fact that you say I suspect a pathologic fracture, and I'm going to I'm going to ask for the ability to RFA. Um, they 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 read your reports, and they're interested, but you usually can get around those things pretty easily. I haven't had much trouble. Um, on the on the flip side, what about times when somebody's you know already an inpatient, going to do a procedure on an inpatient, including an RFA, a spine ablation, and uh, and um, a biopsy? You know, what's the chances of getting paid for that? No clinic visit, never saw the patient before, inpatient instead of out. These are all uh, speak against actually getting paid. Um, so this is what I do. I, uh, I do it anyway. I, uh, patient needs it. I'm there. I just do it. I don't care if they get paid or not. Um, I think that if you're a busy service, the hospital gives you an allowance of a certain number of, of uh, cases that just don't get paid. Um, and uh, my, my feeling is I'm, I'm an advocate for the patient. Uh, the rest is really secondary. I'm certainly not going to discharge them so I can bring them back to biopsy. and it's just, it's just silly. So... Um, my, uh, my hospital is accepting of that. I haven't had problems. Um, I don't get uh, nasty letters from administration. But IR is a really busy service at my hospital. We produce, uh, we produce a lot of uh, revenue. So I, I think we get a, little, a lot of leeway, and, and we use leeway on these kinds of cases. So, um, but I would highly suggest you see them in clinic before, do the case, see them in clinic after. Um, it's just the way IR has to be in the future. So. Um, Here's a, uh, this guy uh, is a HIV patient. He has uh, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. He has a uh, tumor right there. Um, it uh, tends towards the left. So uh, having a device that allows you to navigate in the vertebral body, you know, you're not uh, obligated just to go wherever the pedicle points. That's pretty unique here and uh, an awfully useful aspect of this device. So these images show the columns are, uh, are the same thing on the AP and on the lateral. So in this patient, uh, my goal was, of course, I'm going to ablate all, all the uh, left vertebral body, a little preference for the superior component, and then here we go. So we got navigating up above, navigating sort of midline, below, and then, uh, and then uh, ablating on the way out. So, you know, here, here's the center of the, uh, of the electro, the ablation zone, and it's basically right at the posterior part of the vertebral body. There's an exiting nerve root under there. There's a spinal canal right there. Um, why, why does that work? Because, you know, we're RFAing in a kind of a sensitive spot with a few millimeters of air. Uh, I don't know, but I know it works. I haven't had any complications. I haven't had anybody with a peripheral neuropathy. I've never had any uh, spine complications. Um, but I've got to say, I'm, I'm really careful about uh, one thing, and that is on the MRI, if I see that at, at whatever level I'm working on, if there's not a little buffer of some CSF between me and the cord or me and the nerve roots, then I definitely am, am concerned and more cautious because, uh, you know, you have that whole column of flowing CSF to absorb quite a bit of heat before it, it actually gets to the uh, neural elements themselves. And, uh, you know, if you get technical and think about RFA, RFA is not really a wave propagating through a tissue heating everything. RFA vibrates a tissue, which heats it, which vibrates its neighbor, which vibrates its neighbor again. And if there's even the thinnest layer of CSF between two layers of tissue, the CSF, you know, you'll vibrate the CSF a little and it'll flow away. And it doesn't really transmit across. I think that's why we get away with it uh, so much. 
But, um, you know, if I'm up at T6 and I'm ablating and there's uh, really no flowing CSF between the, the back of the vertebral body and the, and the cord itself, well, then definitely be careful. Um, okay. So uh, this patient actually uh, did reasonably well. Uh, pain relief was uh, immediate, but it wasn't complete. Um, I, I kind of brought this case in to see. I've, I've had quite a few HIV patients with back pain, and I never seem to really get the results that I expect in other, other patient populations, and I have no idea why. But uh, everybody, every time I see someone come by with HIV now, I am um, back pain, and I'm going to do something to them. I always am um, a little resistant. I know it's, maybe it's not going to work as well as it should. Um, so this guy did reasonably well. He went home, and then he came back at three and a half months. Um, he had, um, he had no neurologic deficit, but he did have new pain. Um, he had some numbness of his fingers and uh, toes, and uh, that's uh, if you treat a lot of pancreas patients, they're all in the, some full fury uh, variant, and uh, they get numbness. So that didn't worry me. Um, I thought this was interesting because so uh, I told you that I get cement in a lot of places where it shouldn't go commonly, and I don't worry about it, and I haven't had a lot of negative outcomes. Well, here's an example. I didn't know that the cement had gone to as many uh, undesirable places as it had. You know, here's epidural space. Here's a little bit back there. This is kind of looking around the circle as, as you, uh, these are scanning in and out. Um, so don't forget, this guy went home three months ago and, and had good pain relief, no neurologic deficits. The cement in the epidural space was apparently inconsequential. Um, his reason for pain now is he's coming back because his, his tumor is growing and enlarging, and now it's, it's starting to get bigger and it's coming back. Um, so one other thing I'd like to mention, uh, this guy uh, did not get external beam or stereo. He didn't get radiation. Um, I think that's a mistake. I mean, that's a bit of a failure on my part. Um, they really should get radiation, uh, in my opinion. Um, Define is working on the, some, uh, some research to see how necessary is that. But at the current state of things, I think uh, your goal should be to relieve pain and uh, be adjunctive, add something to the existing clinical pattern of getting radiation. You're slipping in, getting a biopsy maybe, eliminating pain earlier and uh, more completely, but you're not really replacing. But uh, in this case, this patient elected not to get radiation. Um, I think you know, as I, a lot of times people see IR, they think, wow, I'm just going to get this really sexy uh, thing done through a needle. It's going to cure me, and I'm great. And then they start to say, um, let's forget the chemo. I don't need that. And they forget the radiation. I don't need that. Um, I'd suggest uh, for the near future, you, you don't uh, replace radiation. I think you're better off together. Um, so how many levels can you do at once? I mean, this is a problem that comes up occasionally. This guy had uh, diffuse cancer, so all levels. Ray Donk and I both saw him. They said, okay, he's got a lot of levels that need uh, radiation. Um, can you uh, ablate the ones that are most painful, you know, try to get me a, a little head start? Uh, so I saw him in clinic. I palpated him. I found his pain was mostly T8, 9, 10. I said, all right, I'm going to concentrate on those few levels and let you guys radiate everything else. So literally, I mean, the decision to choose these levels as opposed to others was by my uh, deep percussion. This is where he hurts, so this is what I treated. Um, so how many levels can you do? Uh, I've done three, and it went pretty well, not too difficult. I would say uh, if you get much above three, depending on how fast you're injecting, um, uh, you might start to run into troubles with the cement hardening. Uh, I think you could probably do four. It depends how efficient you are. Um, I would say there's a few other pointers to think about if you're, uh, if you're ablating from top to bottom, let's say you should probably cement from bottom to top, the opposite direction, right? Because cement is catalyzed by temperature. So, and when you, when you ablate a tumor, it's going to be warm. So if you put cement into this warm, soft tissue thing, it's going to harden a little faster than expected. Cement may not act the way you're thinking. So just like when I started doing these, you know, I'd put, I'd put all the trocars in on one side, and then they're all kind of hitting each other and awkward. You know, you learn by doing. Here's another case learned by doing. You might as well uh, reverse the ablation and the cementing sequence. Um, so um, this, uh, this patient, uh, this one didn't do as well. And um, 
there's a few interesting uh, cases uh, or things to talk about in this case. 80-year-old uh, man had an L3 osteoporotic fracture, had vertebral plana, didn't have a tumor. So now we're back to our standard that we're all used to. Um, uh, this is what his MR looked like. We got edema, I deep palpated, pain, everything is super clear and nice, no history of back pain. I'm guaranteed I know I'm going to help this guy. So I'm all, all confident and feeling good. Until he shows up. And uh, after the pre-auth process, which always takes a few weeks, um, now look what we got. We got vertebral plana in the anterior two-thirds. So a guy's laying on the table. He's sedated. He's got his IV. He's got back pain, which is, is the primary reason for we're all here. Now what do you do? So we got this vertebral plana. So uh, you'd probably be right in saying, well, vertebral plana, I can't treat it. But that's uh, highly unsatisfying. You know, he's going to go home with the same back pain he walked in with. And he got sedated and laid on your table and you did nothing. So what do you do? So, uh, so I've tried a lot of things. I've tried uh, doing these cases anyway. I've tried uh, using balloons in these cases. You know, I grew up and lived with balloons and that's uh, what I've done the most of. And I can say when I've put balloons in this space, it really doesn't work. For treating vertebral plane, it doesn't work very well. And that's why there's the uh, sort of unwritten rule, don't do it. I think the reason it doesn't work well is because when you can't navigate your trocar into precisely the place between the uh, opposed end plates, you know, you invariably you'll go, you'll leave the end plate because you don't have anything to navigate. You can't turn up, down, it just goes straight. So, um, so cement is going to do the same thing. I really like this uh, uh, midline osteotome for these cases um, because with this ability, you know, if you, you're, you're starting at this angle, Yet you want to be a little higher up here, let's say. Well, this, with this device, you can, you can turn the osteotome a bit as you're going in. You can end up every time directly between the two end plates. And uh, if you can get your, uh, your cement tracked in the correct spot, well, then the cement will generally travel. And uh, I, was, uh, I was awfully excited by this result. It looked great. Um, uh, there's some going in the vertebral bodies, not much, or in the, uh, in the discs. Um, so I thought this was going to be great. He had uh, really no pain. This actually worked. Um, I was a little surprised. Um, I'll tell you what's going to happen in a moment, but a few other things to talk about while we're here. Um, some issues with getting this much cement in the disk space. You know, I know we're not supposed to do it. I do it all the time, sometimes accidentally, sometimes because I'm just trying to get more fill. Uh, I do believe that this uh, really is... Um, this is a bit undesirable because the, the weight of this whole vertebral body above is really unevenly distributed on this, this lump of hard cement, some in the back, which is mostly posterior elements. So this is going to cause troubles eventually. So um, yeah, I, I would try not to do that. Um, so here comes the guy. This is when uh, I failed a second time, I guess, because uh, I lost control of this guy. He came back to the ER with new pain. They didn't call me, didn't tell me that he came back, even though I had just done a procedure a few weeks ago. Um, uh, this is sort of the, the world that IR lives in. They often think that we just do the procedure and we could care less about the rest of the patient care before and after. And that's a shame. It's, tr it's changing slowly, but not, not quick enough. So this guy was seen, came back to the ER. They called ortho, of course, not me and uh, got an MR. You can see there's a nice edema. We definitely got a fracture above. We got this really nice fracture line. You can even see the fracture. We got some axials showing that, uh, you know, it is a little retropulsed. I think that that's new since when I did my procedure, but there's still a little CSF space. So what do you do with this guy? You know, you'd, you'd like to do procedures and be able to clean up your own messes, right? And not, not have to consult other people. Um, uh, what happened and what I'd like to do is not the same thing. What I would propose is uh, do the least invasive thing possible to help his pain. I I'm pretty sure, even not having the benefit of examining him, that the pain is due to the new fracture. Um, but unfortunately, he went to ortho. So ortho does one thing. They put in screws. So um, there we've got some screws. They did some laminectomies. You know, intelligent. I get it. It's a good thought. Uh, this is, you couldn't fault somebody for doing this. This is pretty much the standard of care. But uh, the problem is, you know, they didn't. They just put a screw in the new fracture. They didn't cement it. They didn't do anything else. So, um, so just uh, an example. All right. Got any questions or anything?